So let's go back to that question. How do you feel confident? How do you live in that space where you don't know what the fuck is going on? Why? How? Who? Where? What the fuck is going on with Morgulons? I find it very predictable and understandable even that people want to be certain. And there are many people out there who are dead certain that they know what Morgulons is why it's happening, who did this shit, and where and when we gonna get our financial settlement for it. But the fact is, without facts in accordance with reality, we don't have any truth, and your certainty is actually a delusion. Isn't a lack of humility and curiosity the exact thing that we are having a problem with with the medical and scientific community, y'all? Be the change you want to see. If you want to know what's the deal, the real deal with Morgulons, then the first step in learning is admitting that you don't know. You got to find a way to live with uncertainty, y'all, because the vast majority of this life and this world is a fucking mystery. How do we get here? Why are we here? Uh, what is going to happen to me when I die? Where am I going to go? Who am I? Some of these things just don't have answers. And it's hard to imagine that we could ever find an answer because we don't even know where to fucking look for facts in accordance with reality. There's a lot of diseases that we really don't know shit about. And those are just the diseases that we know are diseases. For example, lupus. Why does it seem to occur in certain geographic locations over other locations? Why does it happen mostly in women? Why does it happen in mostly women of uh, African American or Hispanic descent? Nobody fucking knows. So why in the world would anyone say that they know everything about Morgulons and they are sure they are right? Because, okay, for instance, last night I was looking at a research paper by the Charles E. Holman Foundation. I think it was 2018, but they're describing the filaments and the fibers and all the weird things associated with Morgulons. And when it comes to glitter, this is, by the way, the only mention of glitter in any of the research literature available about Morgulons. Out of 99 PubMed results about Morgulons research, only one paper from the Charles E. Holman Foundation uh, funded research mentions glitter. And they say it came from greeting cards and makeup. Okay, men don't wear makeup typically, and uh, glittery g greeting cards, yeah, I'm just handling those things on the regular, daily. What are you talking about? And then they cite the source of this assertion that glitter has nothing to do with Morgulons, it's a contaminant in the samples. They cite the source as, quote, personal communication and, quote, unpublished data. That, to my knowledge, a phone call and some shit that's unpublished and not reviewed by your peers is not what we call peer-reviewed scientific research. It's just kind of your word against mine. And I can see glitter embedded in my skin under dermatoscopy. I have also seen glitter emerge from intact skin on my hands and on my face, and I have absolutely no doubt of what I am visualizing. I also want to know what kind of greeting cards use hexagon glitter that has hairs growing out of it. I am unaware of a manufacturer that makes hairy glitter. If you know, please write me an email at morewarlons.gmail.com. But I don't think I'm going to get any emails, y'all, because uh, there's no such thing as hairy glitter. There's absolutely no peer-reviewed scientific research about Morgulons as a physical disease, except for that research, which was supported by the Morgulons uh, Research Foundation, Charles E. Holman Foundation, and then that one paper from that Chinese author, Yan, who describes Morgulons disease as being a plant-like illness, which is probably more accurate than uh, its Lyme. Um, so to the authors of the 99 articles that result in PubMed when you search the term Morgulons, all but half a dozen or so of those state that Morgulons is delusional parasitosis and delusional parasitosis is Morgulons. So to those brilliant minds, I ask how you integrate the following facts in into your assertions that Morgs is purely delusional, has no physical cause, and that it's a mass psychogenic illness. So why would there be a drastic increase of Morgulons cases emerging since 2015 when there has been a precipitous decline in media coverage of this disease since 2008 after the conclusion of the CDC study? If it were a mass psychogenic illness, then reports should be declining over time, not increasing. Like I will tell you more about later in uh, this episode, I've been doing my own research. It is just as valid as that performed by CDC, and the sample size is thus far 92 people, and their study was 70 people. So what I have learned is that 78% of people that have Morgulons out of 92 people, 78% have gotten this since 2015. Does not align with the theory of mass psychogenic illness um, and media coverage uh, causing increases in case reports. It just doesn't work. So also currently based on the research project that I'm doing, um, it's shown that the highest case numbers are so far, uh, number one, California and Florida, number two, Georgia, number three, Washington and Michigan. And um, number four is like a five-way tie between Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Texas, uh, and Oregon, I believe. So interesting. Um, but what I would like to know, because a lot of people suggest that this disease that we have, mortal lungs, is caused by methamphetamine or amphetamine use, um, are rates of methamphetamine use 
aligned with that particular list I just gave you with California and Florida at the top, then Georgia, then Washington and Michigan, and then um, those other states I just mentioned. So are those Americans more susceptible to delusion than others? Do they have a larger meth problem? It's a statewide foile à deux. Um, I don't fucking think so. If you want to know what the top 10 states in the union are for meth use, I can tell you that. They are Michigan, number one, New York, number two, Indiana, number three, number four, Illinois, number five, North Carolina, number six, California, number seven, Pennsylvania, number eight, Tennessee, number nine, Ohio, number 10, Florida. So if number one and two are a tie between California and Florida, and if Morgulans was caused by amphetamine usage, then meth usage, then theoretically, the number one state for Morgulans should be Michigan. Michigan is tied with Washington at number four in prevalence of Morgulans case reports. So let's bust that up um, if we can. And uh, so also I would ask them, uh, why does more glons occur in clusters of both families and associates who do not cohabitate? Does delusional parasitosis also incur, occur in clusters like this? Considering the rarity of monosymptomatic delusional disorders combined with the rarity of foile à deux phenomena, how probable is it that thousands of Americans suffer from something or two things that are considered exceedingly rare in combination? And I would ask them, have you ever personally examined a patient's skin with a dermatoscope and found no physical evidence? of embedded foreign objects and materials, fibers, glitters, specks, have you even looked? Because most of the 99 studies that I reviewed don't. <laughs> they don't even mention it. They don't mention running any laboratory tests whatsoever before they decide that, yep, it's delusional. That's not science. <laughs> Again, those who claim the truth bear the burden of proof. Where's the proof? And I've said it before on this show, but I just want to remind you guys, of those 99 research papers about Morgulans that were published in peer-reviewed journals of varying degrees of credibility um, and respect uh, in the academic scientific community, but there are zero research papers published correlating Borrelia burgdorferi or any form of uh, spirochete bacteria with Morgulans disease. The only evidence for that is the evidence provided by the Charles E. Holman-funded research and the people that are doing the research for the Charles E. Holman Foundation, well, the number one expert, quote unquote, physician is Raphael B. Stricker, who in 1990 was censured by the NIH and the University of San Francisco, where he worked, where he was fired for academic dishonesty and falsifying data about HIV. So he opened up a penis enhancement clinic, that failed. He opened up a chronic Lyme business, and then the Morgans came along and he said, hmm, how can we get people in here 24 seven around the clock and charge them two to three times what other people charge for any kind of outpatient services. Uh, I think I know, I've got an idea, Ginger. Oh, Ginger, let's come back to her. Censured by the Texas Medical Board for unprofessional prescribing practices, the overprescription of antibiotics without any clinical laboratory evidence to support it. Y'all go on the Texas Medical Board disciplinary records for nurses and you will find the report yourself. Y'all, she prescribed 90 day refill of ivermectin. Ivermectin is normally taken once a year for parasites. And by the way, if this is Borrelia, why the fuck are you taking an antiparasitic? You don't take antiparasitics for Lyme disease. It doesn't involve parasites. So yeah, just doesn't make sense. Just throwing shit at a wall and seeing what sticks. That's all it is. It's not medicine. If there is no controlled clinical double-blinded drug trial with human subjects to determine the safety and efficacy of any given treatment, then you're just guessing. And if you're gonna just guess, I'm not gonna pay you 500 bucks. And then of course there's Marianne Middleveen. And if you go on her LinkedIn and look at her profile, she has no resume. She has absolutely Absolutely no professional work experience listed except for self-employed and um, she is not a medical doctor she is not a PhD doctor she has a master's degree from Georgia State University um, well she has two master's degrees one in environmental science from Calgary something in Canada University and then uh, a microbiology master's degree from Georgia State so she calls herself a veterinary microbiologist whatever that fucking means but my point is is she doesn't have any experience working with human patients and human pathology she doesn't even have a doctorate and she has zero work experience like clinical on the job experience listed on her personal professional LinkedIn profile. So are these the most qualified people, the most credible people? Tell us what Morgulans is caused by, especially when no one else has replicated their research results. Hmm.